you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai. We began last week looking at some lessons that we learned from Haggai. So we're going to continue that this morning. As I mentioned, it's one of the shorter prophets, but it is full of good information for us. Haggai. We're going to be in chapter 1. Let's bow for a prayer. Kind of Father, we pray that you would be with us as we study together this morning now. May we open our hearts to receive the, the truth from this great prophet. May we show dedication to building the temple of Christ today as they did building the, the temple for you back in the days of Haggai. May we glorify you in all that we say and all that we do. Thank you, Father, so much for everyone here, for the privilege and the blessing we have of our worship and our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Last week, we talked, first of all, about the inspiration of Scriptures. As you notice throughout the prophets, usually something like this will be said. And the word of the Lord came unto the name of the prophet. Or, and God said. That shows that these individuals were inspired. And so last week we talked about the inspiration that they had and the authority that came with that inspiration. Also we talked about procrastination. They had put off rebuilding the Lord's house. While yet they lived in fine houses and they had uh, their lives kind of put together, the house of the Lord, the temple, was yet unfinished. It hadn't been started. And so he was kind of uh, encouraging them, shaming them, first of all, for not being uh, more uh, involved in that work, and then secondly, encouraging them to get busy. The first point we want to talk about this morning is something that uh, God tells them. Consider your ways. Verse 5. Consider your ways. Sometimes we need to have an open, honest self-evaluation. We need to look at our lives through the standpoint of God's Word. And ask ourselves, how does God see me? Consider your ways. They might have rationalized in their minds that it was okay to put off the building of the temple. But you see, that was their rationalization that wasn't coming from God. They might have felt it was okay to, to have their lavish houses and not have restored the temple. So God says, consider your ways. And folks, today we need to consider our ways. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, a moment ago, we just partook of the Lord's sacrifice through the bread and the fruit of the vine. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul tells us that when we do that, we need to self-examine. We might ask ourselves, are we worthy? Well, no, we're not worthy. We wasn't worthy of that death. But since He has died for us, now we're partaking of it, we need to do so in a worthy manner. Which means you've got to consider yourself. Examine yourself. Are you partaking of it in such a way that is pleasing to God? You know, one of the things that we as Christians really need to do a lot of, that's self-evaluating. 
we have a tendency to kind of uh, be like the fellow that James says, that goes and looks in the mirror, sees the problem that uh, he's having maybe with his hair or whatever it might be. And the Bible says rather than taking care of that, he turns around, he walks away, forgetting what manner of man he was. When we open up the Word of God, which is God's mirror for us, spiritual mirror, <coughs> we read that those things in which we may be lacking, things that we're not doing that should be doing, maybe things we are doing that we should not be doing, and as we read these things, do we apply them and make the necessary changes? Or do we forget them and walk away? There's only two, two ways we can go with this. Either we can make the proper changes <coughs> or forget them and walk away. First, or 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? You know, I'm always amazed at Paul. I'm amazed at Paul's life. I'm amazed at his, his demeanor. No matter what happened to him, he always considered his relationship with the Lord. He considered himself and his relationship with the Lord. You know, in, in uh, the book of Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 9, he talks about the fact that he buffets his body daily. You know, he knows that through self-examination that there's things that he has to deal with. So he buffets his body daily lest... He says, when I preach to others, I myself be disqualified. Here he says, examine yourselves, <coughs> test yourselves, unless indeed you be disqualified. This whole concept that once a Christian, always a Christian, is true from the standpoint that as long as we are walking in the light and having fellowship one with the other, then the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse us. As long as we confess our sins. But the moment we cease to walk in the light, the moment we cease to confess our sins, is the moment we become disqualified. When we stop examining ourselves to see that we are in the faith, we can become disqualified. You know, a lot of the denominational world believes that the child of God can never fall away. Well, we know better than that. Galatians 5 verse 4, you're severed from Christ, you're fallen from grace. You know, that's something that we have to be careful about. We, like Paul, need to buffet our bodies. We need to bring them back about into subjection. Lest we become disqualified. We need to, to examine ourselves openly and honestly to make sure that we are in the faith. That we're walking in the faith. How many of us can look into the Word of God right now and see no error in our life. I don't think there's probably very many of us if we are truthful with ourselves with our study of the Word of God. So we must investigate what God would have us to do. In Galatians 6 verse 4, <clears throat> let each man examine his own work, then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. How busy are you in Christ? One of the things that Jesus said, work for the time is coming when uh, the night comes and no man can work. 
We work because the time is coming whenever Christ will return, then there'll be no more time to work. Are you working sufficiently today looking for that time? If you were to examine your work, do you think the Lord is satisfied with what we're doing? You know, years ago, we used to cut wood at my grandmother's. <laughs> we had a two-man saw. You remember those? How many of you ever used a two-man saw? That means you got a handle on both sides and you're both cutting. It's a big saw. <coughs> I wish I had a, a, a dollar for every time Dad would say, Boy, are you riding that saw? <laughs> you know what that meant? You're riding the saw. You're not cutting. Well, I wonder if God wants to look down from heaven and say, Boy, are you riding that pew? You know, we are responsible for doing that work that the Lord started because He's no longer with us. The apostles are no longer here. We've, we ought to carry on what they started. So consider ourselves. Lest, if we're not found faithful in doing the things that God would have us to do, we might be disqualified. The next thing he talks about is materialism. He talks about their houses. They were, they were lavish. They were evidently beautiful. Ornate. But here's the problem. They were so involved in, in their own personal materialism that they forgot about building for God. Have you forgotten about God's building? In 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Materialism is not evil in itself. Having is not the sin. It's our attitude toward the having that becomes the sin. How do we handle it? The end result of a lot of members, according to Paul, was that through greediness, the desire to want more, and not being content with what they have, caused many to be led astray. It's amazing that sometimes even preachers can be caught up in that. Years ago, I attended a seminar. And the, the speaker was talking about how the preacher can become self-supporting within five years. And how he can have great income. Well, there's no way to have done that <laughs> and be a full-time preacher. I can tell you that right now. But you see, a lot of preachers tried it. A lot of preachers got in trouble because they tried it. Inevitably, the ones that succeeded were the ones who had to get out of the pulpit. You know, that's kind of a shame. When we get so overcome with the desire for great gain that we forget about the work of the Lord. That it's no longer important to us. That's where greediness comes in. Luke 12, verse 15. And He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. 
You know, we, we need to take a large sheet of paper or maybe just write it directly on our mirror that our life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. So that every morning we remind ourselves as we go to work or whatever it is we do, that life's not totally about that. Our life is about serving the Lord Jesus Christ and doing His will and working for Him. You know, Dave Ramsey is another one of those gurus for kind of self-help gurus. He said that, I, I have to admit, I like this quote. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have for people we don't even like. <laughs> Welcome to America. That's the way it is. <clears throat> I noticed some statistics, and I can't remember exactly what they were. It was sometime back about the debt of the average American, and it was overwhelming. I have a friend that worked for Lone Star Gas out of uh, Dallas. And one of the things he had to do was to follow up on people who didn't pay the gas bill. Well, Terry told me one time, he said, you know what's amazing? You're expecting to go, in, to go into the lower income area to have to collect. He said, that's not where I spend the majority of my time. I'm in these gated areas with the high dollar cars in the driveway and the high end house that they're living in. They're the ones that are struggling to make their gas payment. Well, what does that tell us? We spend the money we don't have for things we don't need to keep up perhaps our comfort and then try to impress people we don't even like. Materialism is a big stumbling block in our culture today. And it's become so in, our, in the church. I know a lot of members who sacrificed, who has sacrificed their faith for the American dollar. And you know, the thing that always impresses me still on that currency is in God we trust. If we trust God so much, why is it we work so hard, sacrifice so much to have that currency? Just a question I've got. The next thing, the work of the prophet basically centered around they were called out to meet some of the problems and needs of those that they dealt with. You know, the work was to remind people what they needed to do, to remind. Turn to Ezekiel 2, verse 2. This is a good segue into the book of Ezekiel because you get a good insight on how God looked at the prophets. Now Haggai was there dealing with the problem that they had in Jerusalem by not repairing the temple or not rebuilding the temple. Look at Ezekiel 2, starting in verse 2. Then the Spirit entered me when He spoke to me and set me on my feet. And I heard Him who spoke to me, and He said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. 
for they are impudent and stubborn children. <coughs> I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Don't say to them, now, I'm Ezekiel the prophet, and I've got some things I'm going to tell you. You tell them, thus saith the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. Underline that. Put you a couple of exclamation marks behind that. Remember that. You preach and you warn them so that they will know a prophet has been there. I want to tell you something. Let me get on my soapbox for about this long. We need preachers like that too. Sometimes when you go to a, to a service, you don't feel like you've been preached to. We need these kinds of preachers like these prophets so that the house of God will know that a prophet or a preacher has been among them. It's not about handing out flowers all the time. There is some of that. We need to encourage. But folks, if you are wrong... It's my job to tell you you're wrong. If you are believing in heresy, it's my job to tell you you're believing in heresy. That's the only way maybe you'll find out. We like to hear about the love of God, don't we? We like to hear about His graciousness, His mercy. We love to hear about his care. But then we want to, or we, we turn over and we start looking at our God is a consuming fire. And we kind of balk at that. But don't, because that's part of the nature of God. That's part of who God is. He is as much a consuming fire as He is a God of love. And if we don't obey Him, we will result. It will result in the fruits of our disobedience. And we will stand before God as a consuming fire. Now, Ezekiel 29, 16. I want to go down a little bit further in Ezekiel. No longer shall it be the confidence of the house of Israel, but will remind them of their iniquity. Not only do we need to encourage, but we need to point out things that need to be changed. Now, that's part of what I try to do. When I'm talking about your attendance, that's not for me. That's for serving and worshiping and glorifying God, not me, not the elders, not the other members. When we talk about giving and giving correctly, it's not for me, for the elders. Again, it has to do with the Lord's work. When we're talking about our service before the Lord and being busy about our service, it's just a reminder that this is what God would have us to do. And we will be, we will answer for not serving Him. When I remind you about utilizing your talents, no doubt in my mind that we are not utilizing our talents to their fullest potential. We need to be doing that to glorify God, to build His church. Next week we're going to talk about chapter 2. The glorious church. Or excuse me. The glorious temple. And I think it's going to be a, a beautiful story. A beautiful, powerful story. 
Lastly, in this morning's study, verse 12, obedience. In every one of the books of the Bible, there is something said in there about obeying God. So if it's in all of his books, you think it's important? Obeying God. The people feared the presence of the Lord. You know why they feared? You know, if the Lord were to come right now, how many of us would be afraid? Because we know we're not living the way our Lord wants us to live. They knew they were wrong. And they feared the praise of the Lord because they had not obeyed Him. That should have been their motivation to get to work. And they did get to work. And they finished it. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. Saul used a command of God to keep from obeying another command. Did you ever notice that? It was a command that they offer sacrifices, but yet He gave him a different command. You put everything to death. Do not take any spoil. You are to come out with nothing. Yet, what did he do? He saved some of the livestock, the sheep, goats, and the king, Agag. After God told him not to. So what did he say? Well, we needed them for sacrifices. First of all, he said it was the people. Well, we need them for sacrifices. You don't break one commandment obeying another one. That's what he did. Are they all to be obeyed? Yes, they are. But you see, this is one time when a commandment was broken to keep a commandment. And God wasn't happy with that. It was like Samuel was trying to trick God. Oh, but we need these sacrifices. That's why I said to obey is better than to sacrifice. At all times, we need to be obedient to God. Hebrews 5 verse 9, Having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. I want you to see something about that. That's real easy to forget. He has become the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. What if I do not obey Him? He's not my author of eternal salvation. He's the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Let's look at Haggai 1 verse 14 and the lesson will be yours. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Oh, I love this next part. And they came and worked. Haggai got through to them. God got through to them. They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. And that's where we're going to start next year. Next year. Next week. <laughs> Not next year. Next week. And we're going to look in chapter 2. Okay. It's a grand thing to be able to call ourselves Christian. For the hope that we have 
in the gospel, for the confidence that we have in the truth, and the promise of a great reward. So to those who are obedient, Christ is the author eternal of salvation. Are you obedient? Are you obeying Him as you should? That's the question. And only you can answer that question this morning. Have you been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? Have you been baptized into Christ, washing away your sins? If not, you have an opportunity to make that right. God cannot tolerate sin. And God cannot save the sinner. If you are a child of God, but you've been struggling and, and you need some prayer help from the family here, then come while we stand and sing together. I hear the Savior say,